Hello and welcome. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm joined by Christian Ryan, a college student and an author at the New Creation blog. I'll have a link to his work in the text down below. And then also Jonathan Guzman, a high school student. And today we're going to be talking about Archaeopteryx and a recent article by Answers in Genesis about this creature. Um, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having us. Thanks. So maybe we could perhaps begin a little bit by talking about why this is really an important question. Why does it really matter how we define a bird or a dinosaur and into which of these categories Archaeopteryx falls? Well, Archaeopteryx is just really weird. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't quite fit into what we typically think of when we think of a bird or a dinosaur, it, it was this, it was a really weird discovery. And it kind of upsets our general perception on how animals should be classified, right? Because typically when we think of animal classification, at least as far as vertebrates is concerned, it's four main groups. You have mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians. And if you look at pretty much any animal alive today, that classification works great. Uh, turn When you turn to the fossil record, on the other hand, it begins to get a little, it goes a little bit awry. And Archaeopteryx is a classic example of an animal that doesn't seem to fit into that four-tier classification system. Yeah, so one of the reasons why this is also important is because uh, the Bible talks about how God created fowl, i.e. birds or anything that flies, on day number five, where he, whereas when he created mammals and the terrestrial animals, them on day six. And we would assume that dinosaurs are land animals, so we would think that dinosaurs were created on day six. So it's really important to answer the question, is Archaeopteryx a bird or a dinosaur? Because if it's a bird, it would have been created on day five, whereas if it was a dinosaur, it might have been created on day six. Where Whether or not this dichotomy is is reliable or 100% truthful or whatnot, uh, well, we, we could probably examine tonight or today. Yeah, so in the past year, Answers in Genesis has been talking quite a bit about feathered dinosaurs. First, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Haynes, who's a Brazilian paleontologist, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. she first published kind of a lay-level article, which was entitled Dinosaurs in Birds' Clothing, I believe it was. And then she then followed up in the Answers Research Journal with uh, a technical level article entitled The Debate Over Classification of Archaeopteryx as a Bird. And tonight, I think we're probably going to mostly focus on this article, the, the one in the Answers Research Journal. As we go forward here, I want to make it clear that our purpose isn't really to dunk on Dr. Haynes. Really, our purpose is to try to just converse with each other and try to understand what exactly she's talking about here, evaluate what we think of her arguments, and simply to come to a better understanding together, not not to simply degrade her thoughts. I really, really uh, appreciate Answers in Genesis and what they're doing and the literature they put out, uh, whether I disagree with it or not. And I think that it's really useful and uh, really useful in the creationist space. So I, I, I don't hate on Answers in Genesis, but I don't agree with every single thing, which... I'm pretty sure I could say about anybody. Personally, I still I still use a lot of Answers in Genesis resources in my research. I, I I'll use I'll I'll cite Answers Research Journal frequently. So I'm not I'm not opposed to Answers in Genesis or Answers Research Journal as a whole. It's just specific specific articles like this I disagree with personally. <laughs> So maybe we can kind of begin by talking about how we define a dinosaur and, and how we define a bird. Guzman, you want to give us a stab at what a dinosaur is? Sure. Well, there's a, there's a couple of ways you can define dinosaur. There's the obviously the anatomical definition, or you can go into the cladistics, the phylogenetic definition. 
we'll talk about the anatomical definition. A dinosaur is um, a diapsid, which is an animal that has uh, two uh, openings in its skull that, uh, 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 such as the antorbital fenestra. What makes a dinosaur distinct from any other animal with these features is the fact that it has a perforate acetabulum, which no other reptile has. You look at a crocodile, it doesn't have a it doesn't have an opening in its hip. You uh, which the perforate acetabulum, by the way, is uh, the place where the femur goes into the hip. If you look down the the spot where the femur goes, you'll see uh, a cavity um, in the in in the hip. Uh, no other animal has that. Uh, Silosaurids, which are like the closest thing to dinosaur without being a dinosaur, don't have that. They don't have that. Um, uh, you look at any other organism, reptile, they don't they don't have a perfect acetabulum. So Christian, could you kind of tell us how exactly we would anatomically define a bird then? Sure. So when we think bird... We typically are talking about a group of animals called abies. Abies is a class. If you're thinking about uh, taxonomy or animal classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, uh, abies is a class. And it's a very diverse class of animals. There's over 10,000 species. And they come in a wide variety of forms. We've got ostriches, pigeons, penguins, puffins, hummingbirds. It's all over the spectrum, right? Uh, but despite all that variety, we still have a number of features that are used to unite all of these animals into abies. For example, birds have feathers. They lay hard-shelled eggs. They have hollow bones. They have a four-chamber heart. And they're warm-blooded, or if you want to get technical, they're endothermic, which means that they generate their own body heat. They don't have to lie around in the sun for long periods of time to absorb heat from their environment. So since the discovery of Archaeopteryx in the 1860s, what's kind of interesting here then is that Archaeopteryx is sharing features that we would typically associate with being a non-avian dinosaur, but also with members of the Aves, right? And so Archaeopteryx has this interesting blend, what I would say is a mosaic, right? It, it shares these features of both groups. And often... Um, it's been argued that Archaeopteryx may be ancestral to uh, somewhat like of a transitional form to the very earliest birds. And now I think there are birds that are known earlier before Archaeopteryx, depending how you define a bird once again. Um, but Archaeopteryx at least isn't the very first creature in the fossil record to show up with feathers by any means. But because of Archaeopteryx's unique morphology and um, people who believe in universal common ancestry arguing that it's ancestral to birds and kind of this link between uh, the theropods, uh, the predatory meat-eating dinosaurs going over to the birds, creationists have long wanted to argue against Archaeopteryx in this transitional form and, and arguing instead that it's either fully dinosaur or fully bird. But what I find problematic with that is that dinosaurs and birds are really categories that humans have made up, right? Because we know that from the Bible, the real category of classification is really the created kind. And when we come up with the idea of a dinosaur or the idea of a bird, what we're really doing is limping, lumping uh, similar groups of created kinds together. So the weird thing about Archaeopteryx is that it's really a mosaic between birds and reptiles, it kind of throws a monkey wrench into this whole two-tier classification system, reptile versus bird. Uh, so some examples would include, obviously, Archaeopteryx has feathers, as I'm sure we all know. It has a wishbone, like other birds. I'm sure uh, over Thanksgiving dinner, you probably, at least some of you probably grabbed the wishbone of your turkey and snapped it in half. Archaeopteryx has that too. Uh, it also has air-filled cavities in its vertebrae. So those would have been connected to air sacs that would have been part of the animal's uh, respiratory system. And it was once thought that Archaeopteryx had an opposable back toe called the hallux that they would use to perch. But it turns out uh, from studies of more recent, more recently discovered specimens that the toe actually wasn't, the, the, the toe wasn't actually reversed. 
that original specimen where they thought it was, uh, the toe was basically, it was basically broken. Um, so obviously you can't really use that to determine whether or not it could perch. You need a well-preserved Archaeopteryx foot. So having found that, we know it probably wasn't much of a percher. Uh, it also had a number of non-bird characteristics. For example, if you look at its skull, most birds have a beak. Archaeopteryx did not. It had a jaw with teeth, much like a lot of the theropod dinosaurs. So that's interesting. It also had gastralia or belly ribs. Birds don't have that, but that is a trait that we do see in a number of theropod dinosaurs. And this one's kind of interesting. It had a retractable claw, kind of like Velociraptor, which again, not something you typically will see in a bird. And so when you look at all these traits, it's it's not really falling on either side of, of the of the dichotomy here. Is it a bird? Is it a reptile? Well, it's got traits of both. So what do we do with that? <laughs> And that's kind of where I think these early creationists kind of tried to, you know, argue for a kind of simplistic thing here. Well, it must either be a bird or a dinosaur because they were continuing to try to preserve these two separate groups. But as I kind of mentioned before, what we can understand is really that there can be whole mosaic kinds that are situated in between these groups. And really, the only reason we think of these as groups uh, it is partially, I think, because they're alive today. If they weren't alive today, we wouldn't really necessarily, I don't think that dinosaurs and birds are are such majorly separated groups because we would see these kind of creatures that are kind of in between, not ancestrally, but simply morphologically, they have features of both. And one thing I did forget to mention, they also had, Archaeopteryx also had a, a open hip socket, a perforated acetabulum, which again, it's a dinosaur trait. So, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the time when creationists are addressing the subject of Archaeopteryx, one thing that they like to bring up and one thing, one of the first things, in fact, that Dr. Haynes brings up in her article is the subject of some rather odd birds we have today. Uh, one of these is known as a Watson. It's sometimes called the reptile bird. And it's odd because it has claws um, that it will use to climb. I believe in some early stages of its life as well. Does it have them throughout its whole life? No, uh, I, no. When they hatch, they have the claws on their wings that they use to kind of climb around in the tree branches. Uh, but then as they grow up, they are able to fly and they don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. And then ostriches are another example. Underneath their big poofy wings, they've got those claws as well. And so what does this really tell us about um Archaeopteryx then is having claws really such a unique feature if we're seeing it in modern birds today? Is Archaeopteryx really just not that different from the birds that we see today? Well, the difference between Archaeopteryx and something like a Hawatson is if you look at a Hawatson's wing, aside from one of the claws, the other digits in the hand or wing are still fused. And that's a feature that we see in all of their birds. Their the hand bones are fused. They have the same bones as most other vertebrates, including humans. They're just, they're arranged differently and they're fused. That's part of the wing design. But when you look at something like Archaeopteryx, the digits are free and they're not fused. So if, so if you compare an Archaeopteryx forelimb to something like Velociraptor, you'll see a lot more similarities there than with the Hawatson. One of the things I think is interesting also uh, about the article is that early, early on in the article, Dr. Haynes uh, presents the classical, what she calls the classical definition of a bird, which is an animal with feathers. Um, but in order to distinguish dinosaur and bird, you need to have a definition for both, but she fails to give a definition for dinosaur, which is really weird because that should be really easy to do. Um, we did it earlier. There's not much that distinguishes a dinosaur from anything else, but there are things that distinguish and she didn't present those. And I think there's a reason for that. <laughs> right. And this is so crucial to her argument because she's trying to say that Archaeopteryx is a bird, but she's really failing to you know, define the other thing that it could possibly be, namely a dinosaur. 
She says, it is necessary to say that the traditional meaning is intended when the words theropod, feather, bird, and aves are used in this paper and not the modern meaning influenced by evolutionary ideas. And this is kind of her one, one of her big points in this article. She's arguing that the modern definition of birds, that is, as this aves, clustered within dinosauria. So we have the non-avian dinosaurs and then the avian dinosaurs. She's arguing that that is a, uh, a false dichotomy basically made by the assumptions of cladistics. What it is interesting to note here is that she's talking about the traditional meaning. And one of the traditional meanings that she refers to in the article is the Linnaean definition of a bird. In his Systema Natura, Linnaeus referred to birds. And he talked about how they had feathers. He also talked about how they did not have teeth, which is something that we do see in Archaeopteryx here. So what's clear is that even though she is appealing to a Linnaean definition of a bird, she's not even really agreeing with Linnaeus exactly here either, because we have fossil birds like Hespiornis that have teeth, and yet they are still clearly birds. And so these traditional definitions don't really encompass all of the variety that we see here either. So one of the things which Dr. Haynes really majors on is the way in which modern scientists often define a bird, and that is using cladistics. Now, cladistics is basically a way of developing evolutionary trees, um, basically to see how similar organisms are to one another, and therefore, hypothetically, how they might be related to one another. And in modern cladistics, we have a clade, which is known as dinosauria, and that includes all of the dinosaurs. But nested within Dinosauria is the clade Aves, which is the birds. And so from their perspective, birds are actually dinosaurs because they're nested within the clade Dinosauria. And so Dr. Haynes takes issue with this, obviously, because she does not think that uh, Archaeopteryx is a dinosaur. And she wants to say it is only belongs to Aves without being in Dinosauria. And so in her article, she covers this quite a bit, trying to say that this is simply evolutionary bias that is making it cluster within Dinosauria. But I think what's important to recognize here is, no, we can have general patterns of life. That is, just like we have mammalia, we can recognize groups within mammals. I, th I think there's a very similar thing going on here. Because anatomically, I think when we do look at birds, the thing which they are closest to in terms of anatomical similarity happens to be the dinosaurs. And so I think it is appropriate to nest them within this clade, not in an evolutionary sense, but simply in terms of similarity. Any thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I think that's the easiest way to classify birds and dinosaurs. Uh, it's kind of, it's actually not too different from the way we classify mammals. Think about bats or whales. These groups of animals are very different from a typical mammal when we think of a mammal, but still, the reason, wh why do we call whales mammals? Why do we call bats mammals? Well, it's because they have a lot of the same features that we associate as mammals. Both of them are warm-blooded. They have hair. You can't typically see hair on whales, but if you look close up on, on the snouts of some species, you'll find like little whiskers. <laughs> and they all give birth to live young. Not going to talk about the platypus. Uh, well, and, did not, or... <laughs> yeah. and they they all feed their young with milk after they're born. Those are all mammal traits. Bats have those traits and whales have those traits. So despite the fact that whales and bats are so vastly different from all other mammals, they're still mammals because they have those traits. Also important to recognize that really that that's not just an analogy. That is literally what's going on in the dinosaur group because dinosaurs are really diverse. You think of dinosaur like <laughs> velociraptor, but no, wait. There's Triceratops, there's uh, Argentinosaurus, a uh, huge mass of sauropods, and that uh, weigh like about 80 tons. And then you get to small dinosaurs that could have bit in your purse, ladies, or your backpack, guys, uh, like 20 pounders. And it's like, I really have a hard time just saying that we can't put birds in there because they're different from all these. Yet, Lambiosaurus, 
Curasaurus, you have the Hadrosaur dinosaurs, and then the Spinosaurid dinosaurs, and then the Tyrannosauroids. You have to really think and say, there's actually a lot of disparity here. And saying that birds fit within that disparity doesn't really make a connection of relatedness through an evolutionary necessarily. Uh, and, I, and I also think it's important to realize that a number of the traits that we associate, that we typically associate with birds, they're also found in dinosaurs as well, uh, as, as we've discussed. Um, Archaeop as, as we discussed with Archaeopteryx, um, a number of dinosaurs had feathers, and there's a lot of different varieties of feathers. We're not going to go into that right now, but a number Maybe. of dinosaurs had wishbones, just like Archaeopteryx and birds. So T-Rex, Velociraptor, they had wishbones too. And many of them had air-filled cavities in their bones connected to air sacs. They laid hard-shelled eggs. There's a lot of similarities there. It's not so easy to just take a big knife and separate the two. Three-digit foot. Yes, yes, that too. So once again, I think it's important that we as creationists recognize that when we look at these larger groups, there is still an order to life. It's not like the only order to life is simply at the level of the created kind, where each created kind is equidistant to one another. They're all just little atoms floating in space. No, created kinds are organized into larger groups, and we can see a greater order to creation above the level of the created kind. So as Dr. Haynes in her article continues to talk, she has some kind of interesting things to say about cladistics. So I'm going to read those to you. She says, so the first problem with cladistics is that the method of reasoning used by evolutionary scientists is faulty. That is, the use of cladistics on Archaeopteryx, as well as on any other fossil set, has methodological problems because it has evolutionary assumptions and faulty logic. The assumptions and the reasoning cannot be stripped out of the method, since those assumptions and the faulty logic are often unrecognized and unknown by the evolutionists. From a creationist perspective, the premises of the evolutionary approach are not biblical. The scriptures do not teach evolution, and no evolutionary idea should be fitted into the Bible. Even if claimed Christians, creationists, or anti-evolutionists believe otherwise, mere belief does not make it right. Using an authority's assessment to try to prove a point is also faulty reasoning, an informal logically, logical fallacy called appeal to authority. So basically what she's trying to say here is that we can't really trust the basic assumption that animals which are similar to one another are related. And I think on that point, I agree to a point with her because obviously there is a point at which if organisms are similar, we do believe that they are related, right? I mean, if you look at my DNA and your guys' DNA, we're 99.9999% similar. And that implies that we are related, that we share a common ancestor. But when we get to these other organisms like chimpanzees or you know other creatures, we can find discontinuity between us and them, both genetically but also anatomically and that's where i think those principles may break down if we have separate kinds there are bound to be similarities and the fact that there are those similarities doesn't necessarily say we're related what do you think about uh, dr haynes take here i think it's important that we don't simply reject data sets just because they come from evolutionists because a lot of times that is what science is. We will look at other data sets that, sci that other scientists have collected and interpret them. We don't always go out and collect our own data. Sometimes we do, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of times where we are simply reinterpreting what's already been collected. And if we, if we just you know reject it out of hand because it came from people we disagree with, well, that kind of poses a problem for not only science as a whole, but creation science, especially because a lot of what we do is reinterpret data that was collected by other scientists. We do our we we do have original research, but still, reinterpreting data is a part of research that we do. And if we do that, that kind of cuts us off from a lot of a lot of opportunities to learn about 
various er about, about these various areas of science that we just haven't gotten to yet. You're right. This is something that kind of comes up right after this section of the paper. She says, the challenge with this approach is related to the data used in some barominological analyses. So here she's kind of taking issue with barominology. The, the problem here for her is that a variety of different barominological studies placed Archaeopteryx in with dinosaurs and specifically non-avian dinosaurs. And so for her to argue that Archaeopteryx belongs in the class Avi, she basically has to come up with a reason why those are wrong. And so her approach here is to argue that barominology is based on cladistics and that um, the type of data that we get isn't necessarily trustworthy. So she says, the available published data are taken from the evolutionist literature and can be insufficient, lacking, misinterpreted, misidentified, or misrepresented. It is necessary to understand that the fossil record has its own challenges, and the fossil material is also interpreted. Furthermore, the data used in the method can be arbitrary and subjectively chosen, so the evolutionary bias in the data needs to be considered. If there are problems with the data, that will affect the method's outcome, since it is statistical. To a certain extent, I agree with Dr. Haynes here that when we look at data sets, we need to be critical, and we need to make certain that the data is correct and check it to the extent that we can. But as, as you said, Christian, there's a certain point of science that relies on other people's work and building on what other people have already discovered. And at a certain point, we can't just go down the chain of logic to look at every single assumption, every single claim that every single argument we're going to make is based upon because things get very complex like that. And so science relies ultimately on a sort of trust. And I think that if we're going to take the approach that even the raw data describing the anatomical features of fossils by evolutionists is so flawed that we can't even use it. I mean, creation science, to be honest, doesn't have much of a, a future then. I mean, we have so few people. Uh, data collection by ourselves is going to be very small, right? We rely on data by other people because young earth creationism is a small community. Uh, so I, I, I think it's it's not much of a good idea to act as if the data is is flawed like this. I think there's a certain point in science that does rely on trust. And obviously it's good if we can go and verify this, but I don't think that the type of skepticism that she's encouraging is is necessarily good for creation science. Right. We need actual evidence not to trust the data rather than just rejecting it outright because it came from uh, from people who don't necessarily agree with us. But yeah, she still does not give us any solid places where the evidence, where the data has been uh, uh, um, meddled with or at, it's just faulty. Also, a point that I had from earlier is that she says that we can't really trust cladistics because of the underlying assumptions that go into it, such as that, uh, first of all, that universal common descent is true. But secondly, which I reject, right? My creationists reject that that first claim. But then the second assumption would be that uh, um, uh, would be that homology equals relatedness. She says that we can't trust these, but yet she uses the latter assumption to support her case that Archaeopteryx is a bird. And so I think there's a bit of a conflict of interest here and a logical fallacy to be uh, to be uh, noted here. So one of her points that I found kind of interesting is she's trying to talk about, you know, how Archaeopteryx sometimes when people... Uh, depending on the character set they use, when they try to fit it into basically an evolutionary tree or when barominologists study it and try to understand what kind it fits into, it can vary in its placement. What do you think that tells us? She thinks that basically discredits the idea that it is a dinosaur. But to me, that just as much discredits the idea that it's a bird as well. And really, if anything, what that's emphasizing is the mosaic nature of Archaeopteryx. Right. And I think I think it's important to note, to acknowledge here that Archaeopteryx has been difficult to classify for both the conventional paleontologists and young earth paleontologists as well because of its mosaic nature. Uh, depending on the analysis that you're looking at, sometimes it will end up on the bird side, sometimes it'll end up on the dinosaur side. But the key I think that we need to acknowledge here 
is that at least from a pharmacological perspective, when we're looking at determining which which created kind Archaeopteryx fits into, when it does fall on the bird side, it's not lump it's not lumping in with another created kind of bird. When it falls on the dinosaur side, it's not lumping into another created kind of dinosaurs. It's its own group. It's its own created kind. And that's an important point that I think we need to remember. And that would need more individuals from that kind to just distinguish it from both dinosaurs and birds. Yes. So going kind of forward from there, Dr. Haynes goes into a critique of statistical baromenology in particular. And one of the things that she really focuses on is a recent paper that I've actually talked about on the channel by Harry Sanders and Matthew Sarhati um, that, that she cites. And she's using it to basically try to argue against baromenology, statistical baromenology. Um, and, well, I'll, I'll just read you what she says. Almost all the studies published using the BDC and BDIST methods have used selected uh, and coded data sets collected and interpreted by evolutionist scientists based on their evolutionary worldview of cladistics. And she has a point here that when we're looking for particular uh, groups of animals, we're going to look for, you know, traits that define those groups. But I, I don't necessarily see there's a reason why those particular traits when we're looking at to define certain groups wouldn't necessarily also be helpful in understanding the created kinds as well, because really that's that's what we're looking for there as well. But she says evolutionary assumptions cannot be cleansed from their data sets because those data sets are interpreted by evolutionists who are biased. And that's something I disagree with. I mean, I've worked with data sets before, right? And you just remove the character. <laughs> I mean, right? <laughs> you can change a data set if you want to. So data sets are a useful tool for baromenologists to continue working with. It's not like a data set is useful. No, it's, it's telling us actual information that is stuff that we can go verify if, if we're critical of it. And exactly. she does say critical analysis of all data sets should be done before their use since the data needs to be factual to ensure reliable results. But the issue here is that's really not relevant to the whole topic because it's not as though uh, the, the baromenologists who she's writing about haven't looked at their data sets at all, right? I mean, that's almost the implication, but that's, that's of course, not the case. And then she goes on to say, um, the cladistics methods are based on subjective choices based on hypotheses. This makes them very arbitrary and subjective, so the level of certainty is not very reliable. Since data sets are measured indirectly and based on inferences, they involve evolutionary assumptions and bias. And then later on, she she had something even more strange to me. She said, she's talking about the Sanders and Serhati paper here. She says, Sanders and Serhati 2022 demonstrate that one of the tools, relevant statistics used for that, does not determine whether the character states in the data set were measured correctly or in an unbiased fashion. It merely determines what percentage of the characters are present in all taxic contained in the data set. And that to me was really strange because that's the whole point of relevant statistics. So when you have a data set, you're trying to figure out like what percentage of the characters for this taxon are filled on. How, how well do we know its anatomy and how well have we recorded it? And this is just the, the oddest critique to me because it really doesn't have anything to do with substance. It's not like you could even get a computer program to go search the literature and, and check if you've diagnosed character sets. Uh, directly at least I don't know about that that would be helpful to me um but that that was a, a kind of odd critique to me it's kind of like trying to uh find a use for a tool that it wasn't made for like you you use a drill and it's like there's nothing on here that it allows you to like I don't know pull a, a I don't know a nail out of a out of a wall it's like that's not really what it's for, though. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right, and and I don't know of any way which you could actually even do something like this. I mean, you, the only thing is if you had like a three D data set and you could have a computer program go morphometrics to check your <laughs> conclusions about anatomy, but like, yeah, if he has any ideas of how to do that? Please do explain because. <laughs> 
I don't. I, I find it helpful. Um, so uh, one of the things that she brings up next is kind of uh, a particular definition developed by Dr. Mark Surtees about what exactly a bird is. Do you want to tell us kind of a little bit about his ideas about what makes a bird and why she finds that problematic? Sure. So basically what Mark Surtees does is he acknowledges the incredible difficulties creationists have had over the years of classifying Archaeopteryx and determining whether or not it's a bird or a dinosaur. So what he did was he looked at a series of characteristics that define what we typically think of as birds, uh, which is mostly the modern birds. And he goes through those in his paper. Uh, those include a sophisticated flow through lung connected to air sacs. We talked about those a little bit earlier. They have lightweight air filled bones. They have a robust wing attachment site consisting of the wishbone. We talked about that the shoulder blade and the coracoid, that's a, that, that, that's a type of shoulder bone. Uh, they also have a hook-like extension of the coracoid called the acrocoracoid. And they have a brain with an enlarged cerebellum and visual cortex. So the, so the, uh, the way that the brain is set up and they have a pygus style. That's a rod-like or blade-shaped uh, uh, conglomerate of bones at the end of the tail in modern birds. And that's used as an attachment site for large feathers. I'm sure you've seen peacocks. They, they have a really big tail. Most of that's just feathers. The tail itself is actually really short. It's And that's the pagus style. And now what, what, he, what he does say in the paper is that there are a number of animals that do have some of these features and not all of them. It's important to point out that what he classifies as a bird is an animal that has all of these traits or belongs to or belongs to a group that has these traits. For example, penguins don't technically have a pygus style, but they're within the bird group. They're within the group. They're, they're within a group of birds that does have a pygus style, so therefore they still count. And there's a number of dinosaurs that have some of these characteristics. For example, the Majungasaurus, it has uh, it has air-filled cavities that were connected to air sacs in the living animal. And this, and this is clearly an animal that is not a bird. It it doesn't, we, we don't have uh, skin impressions or evidence, direct evidence of integument from Majungasaurus itself, but we do have relatives like Carnotaurus, where we found actual skin impressions. So these are scaly animals. They're not feathered. And they do have a couple bird-like traits, but they're not birds because they don't have all of these characteristics. So what does this um, criteria, set of criterion, developed by Surtees tell us about Archaeopteryx? Does it fall as a bird or not under his definition? That's actually the interesting thing. Archaeopteryx is actually missing a number of these characteristics. Uh, probably one of the one of the ones that stands out the most is Archaeopteryx doesn't have a pygus style. It has a long bony tail, just like any of the other theropod dinosaurs, Velociraptor, Stenonicosaurus. All of these animals have long bony tails. They don't have a pygus style at the end. And by Dr. Sertis's criteria archaeopteryx may not actually be a bird it might just be a feathered theropod dinosaur and this is exactly where your work kind of came up because on the new creation blog yep. a while back you had actually written an article about archaeopteryx and dr sertis's work here on defining a bird and that was actually what she mentioned here let me read that for our viewers a second <laughs> she says Dr. Surtees uses evolutionary definitions and relies on pheromonological analyses, which are also based on and influenced by evolutionary bias and have methodological problems, justifying the need for a change in the term bird. That alone does not make his attempt incorrect, but unnecessary, since none of the reasons he listed for this change is reasonable. Yet his work and ideas have influenced students to keep propagating and basing their views on evolutionary-based definitions, that is the case for an article published by a geology student in the New Creation blog, <laughs> Ryan, 2022. 
<laughs> You're propagating evolutionary assumptions, Ryan. How dare you? <laughs> oh my. This is part of the reason why I think this is so dangerous. Beyond the whole discussion of whether or not Archaeopteryx was a bird or not, Haynes comes across as very exclusionary to me. In her original kind of lay level article published on the Answers in Genesis website, she was really calling out Matthew McLean, arguing that he was basically leading astray the next generation. And that would, to me, what really sets this apart, because I think that is, that's, that's bad. Creationists can disagree, have different scientific interpretations of this, and we shouldn't be acting as if we're leading people astray into evolutionary thinking because we're simply not we can have disagreements about whether birds are dinosaurs or not we can have disagreements about whether australopithecines walked upright or not but we don't need to call out each other like this and obviously this is something that i may have participated in, in the past and you know i think we all get a tendency sometimes to be very aggressive in science and i think this is an example of why it's important as creationists that we all show love to one another and and don't uh, call out each other in unnecessary ways like this. And our views even aren't really that different if you think about it. We still believe yeah. in a six-day creation week. The days are normal, day-night cycles. We believe that there was a, a an actual historical curse. We believed that there was a global catastrophic flood that wiped out all of the air-breathing land animals and humans except the ones on the ark. We believe in the Tower of Babel. We believe the Earth's just a few thousand years old. I mean, even when you come to the topic of Archaeopteryx, are we really that different? Because really, if you look at this, I mean, I don't think Dr. Haynes would even say that Archaeopteryx is related to any of the modern birds. If, no, if you would no look at she that, doesn't. She, she'd say it's some extinct created kind, which is probably exactly what all of us here would exactly say. And, and so that's why this really comes down to a, a debate over definitions, which often yeah. I think can be very pointless because it's just us debating about how we like to call things. And, and that's really doesn't have a lot of substance in the real world often. Right. Um, I do have a question though. It's a genuine question because I didn't get the time to read the, uh, the paper that Ryan talked about. Um, one of the criterion was uh, a piga style for birds. Was it? Mm -hmm. yes. Don't, don't some non-avian theropod dinosaurs have a pega style like um, Cadipteryx? And so that's the weird thing, too, because AIG also thinks that Cadipteryx is a bird. Oh, you, you, want to, you want to hear something really weird? So AIG often talks about how one of the differences between birds and theropod dinosaurs is that theropods have a lizard hip structure, whereas birds obviously have a bird hip structure and they do consider Caudipteryx to be a bird but the irony is that Caudipteryx actually has a lizard hip structure so based on their criteria this is a bird with a lizard hip structure yeah and then uh David Menson said a couple of years back that if it has feathers it's a bird so oh he's after had feathers he didn't say it did, but he said, if it did, it's a bird. And so I'm like, okay, <laughs> all right. If that's how you want to define it, all right. Yeah, and the problem is, once we get to a definition like that, I mean, what do we even do with the sorts of things that we're finding feathers on now? I mean, and that's why, as, as you pointed out, kind of before we were talking, Guzman, you pointed out that if you define feathers as being on birds, then what do you do with the feathers that aren't on birds? Does that make that creature a bird? I mean, it, it's just a, a bad way to define what a feather is. Can you kind of talk a little bit about the different types of feathers and kind of her take on the various types of feathers and what's really going on here? Depends on who you ask, but there are eight general feather morpha types. Um, five of them, I believe Cow 2018, or I forget who, uh, has said that they're actually, um, five of the morpha five of the morpha types are unique. The other three are actual, um, uh, taphonomically altered 
uh, from the original morphotypes, but generally there are five to eight different types. The ones that we are familiar with today are plumul plumulaceous and panaceous. Plumulaceous is like the kind of plume, fluffy kind feathers that you'll see on a, like a, a bird chick. And, Just like uh, down feathers, right? So the, so, so the feathers inside of a uh, pillow, for example. Right, exactly. And then panaceous feathers are the ones with the complex structure, right, with the barbules and whatnot that stretch off the rachis. And these ones are generally used for flight. Uh, you, if you, like, find a blue jay feather out in the outside, that's a panaceous feather, generally, right? And so we, we look at these two definitions and we say there are plumulaceous and then there's panaceous. You look at the fossil record, there's at least three other types of uh, panaceous feathers. There are not panaceous, but just general feather morphotypes. And what Dr. Haynes fails to recognize is that, well, what she claims in her article is that these other feathers are not feathers because feathers have a complex structure. But she's really defining the panaceous feather. Um, and then she says that these other feather types are really just evolutionists saying that they're feathers so that they can say they're feathers on dinosaurs. And so they're really just evolutionary assumptions when it's really just we find these other things that look really like feathers or some sort of um, integument. We have to give them a name. <laughs> so it's either it's a feather or it's a new kind of thing. and so. And then she talks about uh, Sinoceropteryx, which we can talk about later. But uh, some of the other feather types are really just simple, simple like barbs um, that, that come off the skin. Others are like barbs, and then they look like the uh, like the truffula tree in the Lorax, and they have that little uh, tr uh, truffula up there on the on the top. And so there's a lot of different varieties of feathers. Um, and so that's really what it, that's really uh, the different kinds of feathers we have. If we get that kind of loosey goosey with definitions, then you kind of have other problem areas. For example, if we if we said that all mammals give birth to live young and there are no exceptions, well, what do you do with the platypus? Well, it doesn't give birth to live young, so it's not a mammal. Period. <laughs> yes, that's obviously problematic for a number of reasons. <laughs> So I think what's kind of interesting here, I, th I think there's kind of two points. Uh, one is that she does also seem to take issue with kind of inferring feathers on animals that are very similar to ones that we have found feathers for. So, for example, uh, do you want to provide an example where we have one relative that we know has feathers and another one that we don't know, but we could probably infer because they're probably pretty similar and, and probably related. And she, and she takes issue with inferring that. Gladly. So I guess my favorite example is in dromaeosaurs. For example, I've heard a number of creationists say that Velociraptor didn't have feathers because we don't find any feathers on it. Well, that's kind of problematic because in order to get feathers to preserve in the first place, they have to be preserved in a, in a uh, very specific type of environment. If you're, if you're trying to preserve really fine features like that, really fine, delicate features, usually that's going to be in fine grain sediments. So your mudstones, your limestones, which is why Archaeopteryx is so well preserved. But Velociraptor is found in the, it's going to be a miracle if I pronounce this right, Jadok, Jadokta Formation, I think is how it's pronounced, in uh, the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. Mm. And this is a sandstone deposit. Sand is not fine grains. So therefore, you don't typically get feathers in those types of depositional environments. Hence why Velociraptor is not found with feathers. Sort of. However, we do find uh, quill knobs on Velociraptor arm bones. Just a quick disclaimer here. It may not be exactly Velociraptor. There's a bit of debate whether it's Velociraptor or a close relative called uh, Sagan. But... That's neither here nor there. If you saw a Sagan run by or a Velociraptor run by, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They're very similar. But we found on these um, forelimb bones a series of indentations that are extremely similar, virtually identical 
to the cool knobs on modern birds. Those are the attachment points for the feather, for the wing feathers. And we also, we do find cool knobs on other closely related dromaeosaurs like Dakota Raptor and Dineobolator. But we also find in other formations, dromaeosaurs with actual feathers. Uh, my favorite example is Zhang Wanlong. That's a dromaeosaur from China. And what I, what I like about it is this is really the first dromaeosaur fossil that we found that's one of the larger species with feathers. Most of the feathered dromaeosaurs we found so far are things like Microraptor and uh, Cynornithosaurus. These are, these are really little guys, about you know, three feet long, and most of that's tail, right? So they're really little. Zhen Wen Long is about five feet long, which is almost as big as Velociraptor, which is about six to seven feet long, about the size of a turkey. Not a man-sized predator like we've seen in certain movies. But that's why this discovery is really impressive. It, it has, Jean Wanlong has long wing feathers. It has feathers running down the tail. It's a really beautiful specimen. And it's got that classic sickle-shaped talon that you see on animals like Velociraptor. So it, it's a dromaeosaur, it's a raptor, but it's got feathers. And if you compare Jean Wanlong to something like Velociraptor, they are more similar to each other than either one of them is to other birds or other dinosaurs. So even though we don't find feathers on Velociraptor itself specifically, we can infer that from Jean Wanlong that animals like Velociraptor have feathers. And I think an, an important thing to remember is we actually don't have any dromaeosaurs that were covered in scales preserved in the fossil record to date. We've only ever found them with feathers. So the most logical conclusion with the fewest number of assumptions is that simply dromaeosaurs had feathers until we find evidence of a scaly raptor. That's the best option available to us. I think another interesting point that you just brought up is microraptor. And this is another creature which provides throws a, a monkey wrench into a, a, a simple definition of a bird is, is just something with having feathers. I mean, Microraptor is just this bizarre creature. It has claws and it has wing feathers coming off of not only its forelimbs, but also its back limbs. It's just bizarre. It's, we don't, I don't think we see anything like that today with birds having pinaceous feathers come off of their rear limbs. It's, it's, it's very bizarre. It's not like anything we see today. And it's kind of odd to think that that is just a typical bird. It, it's, it's clearly not. <laughs> There's something unique going on here. In the paper, Dr. Haynes provides this illustration that you see here of the various tails of these different dinosaurs. And one thing which is really striking is how long the tails of these creatures, which she's uh, categorizing as dinosaurs really are. I mean, we, whether we're looking at Archaeopteryx or Microraptor, they just have these very, very long tails that are actually kind of similar to those that we're going to see in predatory dinosaurs. What, what do you think about that, Christian? To be honest, I'm not 100% sure what point she's trying to make because, as you can see, they're clearly more these uh, these long bony these long bony tails are clearly more similar to each other than they are to something like a bird tail. And as as I stated before, one of the defining characteristics of birds, according to Dr. Satis, is the presence of a pygostyle. style, and which again is those those few fused vertebrae at the end of a short tail. These animals clearly do not have a short tail they're very long so <laughs> that's clearly that, that's clearly the main cutoff here it's not the number of vertebrae like these tails are clearly different even though even though the exact number of vertebrae in the tail may differ they're clearly distinct they're clearly distinct from something like a pygostyle style ending bird tail mm -hmm. And not to say that they're exactly like these meat-eating dinosaurs like Allosaurus, which are right, obviously, right. they have much longer tails and their vertebrae aren't as fused either. Exactly. But the point is that they have long tails, quite a bit different than the extent birds and even the fossil birds that we see. Yes. So let's kind of move on. I'm going to read here the kind of final parting words of her paper. Here we go. 
Creation and secular scientists remain divided on Archaeopteryx's classification. As this paper demonstrates, the observable data is the same, but the scientists that interpret them have different starting assumptions. Young Earth creationists believe God created birds and dinosaurs. Evolutionists believe that birds and dinosaurs share an ancestry history. That is why the interpretations of the data sometimes arrive at opposite conclusions. I think this is a little misleading here because it makes it sound as if you're following the Bible, you're going to end up with birds and dinosaurs being two completely distinct groups, which I don't think is the case, once again. Um, she says the attempts to reclassify, redefine, and reinterpret Archaeopteryx will not make it become a dinosaur. A bird will never be a dinosaur, regardless of what, how, or who states it. Birds have distinctive features like feathers, arm bone anatomy, and a pygo style that are irreconcilable to those of dinosaurs. Any thoughts? Wow. It sounds very fiducia like <laughs> is what I'm going to say. Um, which I'm also surprised with how little she actually cites Fiducia. But I think that the main crux there is that, again, she, you have to establish definitions because what she's done is that she's basically taken the public's view or what is generally viewed as a dinosaur and what is generally viewed as a bird and basically said, see, there are two different things, except this is not a little kid's book. This is not a popular article. This is supposed to be a technical article where you're supposed to define them exactly and then show how they're different or how they're similar. And I think she's failed to do that. And I think that n none of us have actually followed to the conclusion because what she's done is that she said there's these features that appear in birds, but she neglects to tell you that they appear in dinosaurs, or she refuses to believe that they appear in dinosaurs, and then says, you see, they're two different things. When earlier in the article, she was saying that morphology doesn't really matter, because God can create patterns in creation anyway. And so it's like, okay, you can, I'll let you go on. <laughs> I think it's also just treating these groups as if they're real. And as we've already established, they're real to a certain extent is that they're patterns. But to say that Archaeopteryx will not become a dinosaur, a bird will not become a dinosaur, that, that's making a statement about definitions. I, I mean, right, that, that's, that's like me saying a pen will not become a marker. Well... It, it all depends how we define a marker. A hundred years from now, we could define a marker differently, right? And so when we're just making a, a bold assertion like this, just based off of a definition, it just becomes kind of useless. I mean, right? Um, until we're actually going to settle on a, on, a, on a definition, which she doesn't do for dinosaurs. She never defines the term dinosaur here. Yeah, I think that's the key part that's missing from this paper. If you're going to argue that there's a clear distinction between birds and dinosaurs, you, we kind of need to know what you call a dinosaur. <laughs> right, and uh, of, of the, to repeat what Peter said, it's like saying, uh, it's like saying a tortoise will never become a turtle. It's like, okay, I know the public's view is that, okay, a turtle has this kind of features, like a generally a smaller carapace and then a like a flappy feeder. And then a tortoise is like this land dwelling or uh, bulky, um, generally terrestrial more. Okay, a tortoise will never become a turtle, no matter what you say, no matter how you define turtle. It's like, Turtle is really just the group that encompasses all of turtles and tortoises. <laughs> so, that's really what she's trying to do. A bird will never become a dinosaur, no matter how you define either of them. And so it's like, okay. Because she's, she's acting as if there is some substantial truth or reality here, as if there is somehow, somewhere, a fact that Archaeopteryx is a bird. Where Which is a, that doesn't exist, right? Archaeopteryx belongs to a created kind that that we know that's certain, but 
bird and a dinosaur once again are, are these groups that we are coming up with and we don't even know how faithful they are to the actual patterns of diversity that god created right and so to say something like this i think is problematically is, is, is problematic because it's acting as if we have this whole pattern of diversity figured out and and we really don't and we don't know that birds and dinosaurs are, are real groups as she wants to argue yeah she she's using a very old classification system it, it it was useful and it still is to some extent but it was developed before paleontology existed we didn't have feathered dinosaurs we didn't have um australopithecines we didn't have fishopods we've discovered a whole new whole new categories of organisms that we just don't have today so to think that we can just simply take a classification system that was invented before paleontology was a thing and then just apply it to all these new discoveries probably not the best approach mm-hmm so she goes on to say, so is Archaeopteryx then actually a feathered dinosaur? This remains a question of definition. That is the cladistics approach with Archaeopteryx. In contrast, in a biblical worldview, as well as on logical grounds, the anatomical feathers of the skeleton and skull, the presence of feathers, which is a key diagnostic for bird identification, and following the classical tradition, line, traditional Linnean classification and reasoning, it is concluded that there is no reason for Archaeopteryx to be anything other than a bird. Except all the reasons we just gave. <laughs> so as we're kind of wrapping up here, I think we all kind of agree that this is really a question of definitions. So why is it important? I think you all agree that Archaeopteryx is a dinosaur. But why is it important that we call it a dinosaur? If this is just a debate over definitions, why why can't why do, why do we have to be this specific? Why is it important to you to do that? Well, we need to be consistent when we're describing emphasis on describing the diversity of life, right? So if we call Archaeopteryx a bird, just a you know a normal bird, well. In order to be consistent, yeah, exactly. In order to be consistent, you'd have to call other animals birds that we typically don't think of as birds. Like what traits does, well, what bird-like traits does Archaeopteryx have that Velociraptor or Jean Wan Long doesn't have? They're very similar animals. And so are, are you going to call all of those birds? Or are we just going to cut off, off Archaeopteryx from being a bird? So you have to be consistent. You can't, you can't have some of these animals be birds, some of them not, despite the fact that they're more similar to each other than they are to anything else. I think this goes to the deeper problems about arguments about taxonomy, because taxonomy is a big issue, right? People debate about taxonomy all the time. But realistically, I mean, we as young earth creationists agree that there are separate created kinds. Species are fake. They're just variants, right? I mean, speciation is just a term to describe things getting different over time and we can define how different they get over time in different ways. But coming up with these labels isn't the important thing. The important thing here is that we agree with Dr. Haynes that birds and these separate created kinds are not related to other different created kinds that we typically call dinosaurs. So T-Rex isn't related to a chicken. And that is what we agree on here. And that is really the important point that I think creationists have to focus on going forward. I think in the future, creationists have to focus on the created kinds, because really that is the important issue at hand, not whether Archaeopteryx is a bird or not, because that really doesn't tell us anything except about what we think about Archaeopteryx. What we actually need to continue to research into is what created kind Archaeopteryx belongs to. And I think that's where the important work is going to be done in future. And I think that's actually a really interesting area of research that's already started. Obviously, the results are tentative, but there was a recent paper by McLean et al. from 2018 where they analyzed Archaeopteryx uh, in comparison with other birds and dinosaurs. And again, there as, as we stated before, there was a little bit of disagreement in some of the analyses, but 
Their conclusion is that Archaeopteryx probably belongs to the same created kind as animals like Velociraptor and Stenonicosaurus. So a very different view from something creationists have held before, but it really makes sense. If you look at Stenonicosaurus, if you look at Velociraptor and Archaeopteryx, they're they're all they have they all have a very similar body plan. And Archaeopteryx may or may not be within the the group that contains dromaeosaurs, raptors, and and um, stenonicosaurus, which belongs to the truodontid family, um, though those two di those two groups belong to a larger group called Dino Deinonychosauria. Archaeopteryx may or may not belong to that group, but it still shares more similarities with them than other animals. So it does make sense. Are there any kind of concluding thoughts that either of you had to say? Well, I think the biggest takeaway here is that definitions are important and that we shouldn't let disagreements like this tear apart young earth creationism because at the end of the day, we pretty much believe in the same things. We may have disagreements in terms of definitions or whether this animal belongs to this created kind or that created kind, where the pre-flood and post-flood boundaries are. There's lots of these little disputes, but generally speaking, we're all still young creationists. Our position on the on the important things is pretty much the same. So that's not a reason for us to start name calling and building fences and just breaking apart groups. <laughs> right. And I think sometimes our approach to science is we can see something so clearly. Why can't these other people see this as well? But really, um, I, I think the Bible talks to this about, you know, stronger and weaker brethren coming alongside of each other. And, and that's really an important point here that we're not, we're not supposed to just go after people who disagree with us, right? It, it's, if we think we're right, we're, we are called to approach them humbly and, and try to reconcile with them and try to come to a better understanding of the world together. Right. Like that's something iron that's not always iron. easy. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Iron sharpens iron. And I think it's also a really important part in science in general as well. Like it's a good thing to have multiple positions that this, this uh, concept is called uh, multiple working hypotheses. That's a really common thing in science. Everybody doesn't agree and that's okay because maybe I'll have an idea. And since it's my idea, I'm not going to be super critical about it, but these other guys over here, they, they don't share my opinion, so they're going to try and attack my idea, and that's a good thing, because then I will try and defend my idea against their critiques, which helps me to strengthen my idea, and I could do the same to theirs, and that's how strong scientific models are built. I don't know what Dr. Haynes's next project is, but maybe she'll try and defend her Archaeopteryx paper, and make a stronger version, make a stronger argument. Are there any right. particular things that you would like to see her address in future about this article? Definitely definitions. <laughs> Next time. Define theropod. Uh, <laughs> um, properly define bird and feather without having to use a circular argument saying that bird is anything that has a feather and feathers are only present on birds. Um, um, correctly diagnose your fossils that you're talking about, please. <laughs> um, and then I would like to see a substantiated claim that Archaeopteryx couldn't eat, like like flesh. I mean, it probably, it, it it probably ate smaller things, but it's like, it's not just eating seeds like a like a not like a bird or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Things like that. Okay. Another thing I'd like to see is how she how she would provide an alternative to statistical barminology. She's very she's obviously very critical of it, but simply attacking a method because it doesn't you know you, you don't you don't agree with it and not providing an alternative really isn't that helpful um because in in my personal experience statistical barminology has been very helpful in at least 
preliminarily speaking, determining which species belong to which creative kinds. And she doesn't really provide an alternative in the paper. So how would she define kinds? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I think that's that's something that's lacking. I, th I think I'd like to see in future kind of a, a more robust uh, way of dealing with statistical barominology because I, I thought the, the point the, the points which she addressed in the paper really weren't very crucial to taking down statistical barominology if that's something you're trying to do. So I'd like to kind of see more of a discussion of kind of looking into ways in which statistical barominology maybe splits things up that we know are of the same kind or, you know, some sort of thing like that, which actually uh, Sanders and Serhati attempted to do and kind of failed that in their previous paper. But that's something where if you're going to try to take down statistical barominology, that's something that I think would need to be uh, better developed. And that's obviously crucial to our argument. All right. Yep. Well, thank you both for joining me this evening. Glad we could have a chat here about this article. Uh, and viewers, thank you so much for watching this. Just remember, Archaeopteryx is a dinosaur, um, but we don't need to be jerks about this. We can be nice, get along with people, and we can um, heartily disagree in a loving way. Thank you all for watching.